Hello and good afternoon. Welcome to the first of a new series of webinars um, hosted by myself, Matthew Goddard from Rembo Consultancy. Um, we hosted our first webinar back in April, uh, which was looking at the future of the retail sector in terms of the stores of the future and the multi-channel um, offer and this is the first of a series we're hopefully be doing it on a monthly basis so this particular one um, was another popular topic when we surveyed um, quite a number of you guys and you came back and you told us the kind of things that you'd be interested in finding out about and uh, about your challenges and your issues so employee engagement um, how to harness and retain your top talent is the subject for this webinar um, so I'm really uh, keen to um, introduce our panel of experts Linda Holbeach, Fraser Rendell and John Shuna Hevel um, who are all experts and thought leaders in this particular space um, I'll come on to those guys in a moment. For those of you who don't know me and what we do here at Rembo, so we are a retail recruitment agency and we specialise within the fashion, beauty and luxury brand markets. Um, we work across various specialist um, niches uh, covering the entire retail sector um, and I specifically recruit for retail operations and senior level roles. The reason that we're hosting a webinar um, is because we've been told by clients, by prospects that they want something different really from agency partners. They want us to do more than simply fill jobs. They want us to add value. Um, so we were racking our brains really trying to figure out the best way we could do this and webinars seem to be quite a popular way of actually engaging people um, and really working with others to give particular knowledge that we perhaps can't always always give uh, which is why we're going to be hosting on a monthly basis now added value webinars and always featuring speakers always featuring um, experts who really have the knowledge to give you the insight that you need um, so without further ado I'm going to go over to introduce our three experts starting off with Linda so Linda if you can give me a bit of a uh, overview really of you of what you do and your background well thanks Matt uh, I think your slide says quite a lot about me actually which is um very nice. It's uh, it, it's sort of a summary of uh, a career where I've been a director of several organisations, and so if you like, responsible as a line manager and an executive for making sure that the organisations are successful. And I've drawn the conclusion that that's only possible if the people in those organisations are are engaged, as we now describe it. Um, I also write and consult, and I co-wrote, as you can see from the write-up, a book with Geoffrey Matthews, who's now a vice president for Nestle in, in Switzerland, um, of HR that is, uh, about employee engagement, because we were very um, concerned to get something that would address engagement through the lens of the line manager, not just through HR, because HR generally has a pretty good idea about engagement, so, um, so that's me. Fantastic. Brilliant, Linda. And uh, moving on now to Fraser. Okay. Thanks, Matthew. Um, so I'm coming at it, I think, probably from a slightly different perspective to many um, experts on engagement in the fact that I come from an operational background. I've spent 20 plus years working in operational roles in um, hospitality, retail and healthcare um, and managing large um, accounts across the country to then start moving towards changing culture and engagement. Um, and so because of my operational background, I make sure that everything I like to look at around engagement is focused on a practical and a measurable element. Um, and I've had the opportunity, a bit like Linda, to, to write some articles, obviously not as many as Linda, though she's um, been very successful in that area. And I've had the opportunity to write for people such as The Telegraph and Thomson Reuters um, and I know that we're going to be circulating one of our, my articles later on 
uh, which is um, a bit of a controversial one, but a bit of fun as well, called The Customer Comes Second, which has um, been seen in many of the trade magazines. I also do some work with Engage for Success, um, as I know uh, Linda and John do as well, um, and as well as sitting on a group looking at the future of engagement and also neuroscience around engagement, I also lead one which is now looking at performance management and the impact that that has on employee engagement as well. So that's a, a quick overview on me. Brilliant. Thank you very much, uh, President. We will be um, circulating your article. Uh, so if anyone's interested, I'm sure they are, um, we will be forwarding details of that over the coming days. Um, and now finally over to John. Great. and Thank you, Matt. And, um good to be on a panel with Linda and Fraser and like the two of them I am also in, involved in the Engage for Success movement I suppose you'd call it. I have a particular involvement on the uh, cross-cultural group there. So I'm another consultant. Um, I work for an organization called MNX. MNX specializes, well we specialize in employee engagement but actually with the purpose of improving organizational performance. So I suppose we see employee engagement very much through the lens of being a part of achieving an end result, which is an organization achieving its vision its and delivering through its values and achieving high performance through its people. Um, and the flip of that is that the way to achieve that is by having people in your organization who have the opportunity to achieve their personal goals. We tend to call that personal fulfillment. It's a very personal, um, unique, special thing. Linking the two together is where we see engagement making a difference to organizations. And as the, uh, as the slide says, we run a blog where we post articles every Tuesday and a weekly news roundup every Thursday and you can see the, uh, the URL there. So thank you, looking forward to it. Thank you John, brilliant and I'm really pleased we've got the three um, excellent um, and different unique um, um, perspectives really on this key area and I know that um, it's coming up as a major challenge um, with particular retail clients so I'm excited that you've all joined us this afternoon um, so let's move on then to the first question um, so I won't read them out I think everyone can see them on the screen so I'll keep it up as we're talking through um, and whoever wants to kick this off first go ahead well uh, I, I would mind jumping in quickly on this because um I think people these days seem to to uh, take the word loyal as no longer relevant, um, and yet I think uh, in retailing generally um, there is massive turnover in some parts of retailing, and uh, you know I think I think people have learnt over the years that uh, if the company isn't loyal to them, they're going to have to be loyal to themselves. So I think there is something around the company itself has to demonstrate pretty strongly to uh, to people that um, they value them. And I think that goes from top to bottom, from beginning to end of the employee life cycle. It's interesting how many companies now are really paying attention to things like um, not just recruiting people in numbers and putting them through an induction, but you know, really bedding them in, welcoming them in so-called onboarding terms, yeah. you know, giving them buddies and so on, and uh, really trying to uh, help them become efficient and effective pretty quickly. And then development opportunities for growth are absolutely key. Um, you know, it seems a, a sort of contradiction in terms, develop people and then they'll go. Well, they may, but they're more likely to stay if you develop them. And then recognition is crucial if they're doing anything good not just catching them wasting time sort of thing and being clear what you want to, them to be doing you know so that you're recognizing them for the things that you do want them to do and finally i just say i think one of the key things is um you know the old saying i own what i help to create so opportunities people might have to get involved in decisions in sharing ideas in finding ways to do things better straight differently 
um, anything that can really get people alive and sharing their ideas in a useful, practical way uh, should be should be um, leapt upon and done something with on the basis that people are then more energized and feel, well, you know, if they're interested in me, I might be interested in them too. So for me, it is a cocktail all the way through the um, life cycle, really. Uh, John here. I'll, I'll go next then. Um, I, it's Fraser. I think um, absolutely Linda's made some very valid points there. And I think overall, though, the challenge is around this is a culture. This isn't just a series of one-off elements that you're going to do. This is around creating a larger culture within the organization that focuses on the importance of the people. Um, and the risk is often that, particularly in the retail environment, when it's um, lots of short-term targets that we're aiming for, particularly financial and revenue, is that sometimes the financial piece comes ahead of the people, and ultimately the people achieve the finance. So it's about thinking, what can we do to help make sure the people help us achieve those finances? So the bits around the purpose, the why, um, why are they there as opposed to just what is it that you're there to do? So helping them understand a purpose that is bigger than the product. Um, the, the voice piece is, is absolutely key, and this is one of the big enablers and engage for success that everyone's talking about. And anything you read around engagement always comes back to this opportunity of giving people a voice. Um, and currently, I'm sure my colleagues will correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's 66% of people are walking around business saying they've got more to give, but nobody's ever asked them. So there's this internal frustration going on about they have the innovation, they have the answers, they can tell you how to fix it. But if you don't have the voice, um, opportunity for people to get involved, be autonomous in how they do and being empowered in the work that they do, then we're going to struggle there. And then equally, that, that piece also around the praise and the recognition. And that I think the risk is that when we think about praise, we sometimes get hung up about recognition and praise has to be linked to money. And it doesn't. Because actually, from the way that our minds work, we actually get a higher satisfaction level from unexpected small recognition as opposed to the large annual expected pay rises. So it's how do we maximize and get on that? So I would say, make sure people understand why. Give them a voice which allows them to have autonomy and empowerment of what's going on in the business. And do that recognition piece and make them understand why it was so valuable to what it is they're doing with the business. Brilliant. Mm. Thank you, Fraser. And John, um, what, what's uh, your take on, on this? Yeah, my, my take on this is I, I kind of, well, I certainly agree in terms of um, the things that one can do, which both Linda and Fraser have talked about. But I sort of start from a slightly different perspective. and. And that's to ask the question of the senior leadership in any organization, you know, retailers amongst many others, is do you really want to have engaged employees? And the reason I ask that is not because I don't believe that you should, but because I believe that every organization needs to be clear what the consequences of looking for of, of working to have engaged employees are one of those probably the biggest is that they will expect to contribute to the success of the organization which means in my slightly tongue-in-cheek way of putting it you're going to have people or you currently have people who follow rules rules being the processes and systems and structures and and, and expectations so the the, the, um, both the both their written contract and their psychological contract, people who bend the rules and people who break the rules. If you want employees to follow the rules, you probably don't want them to be too engaged, because engaged employees will be looking to find ways to bend the rules, i.e. to make things better, and sometimes to break the rules because they are standing in the way of them doing a great job for their customers and for your shareholders and for themselves. And so making that decision first helps you then with what is 
in terms of implementation, something that takes quite a lot of work. You are re you are re negotiating the way in which the culture works, as uh, as Fraser has mentioned. And assume that you that the decision is yes, that's what we're prepared to do. Then I think there are some very straightforward things that um, we can use to help our employees become more engaged, so employee engagement strategies. First of all, have a clear vision, values, and set of priorities. So many organizations have mixed priorities. So many organizations don't live the values that they espouse. And so many organizations, or so many employees in organizations, struggle to, to be able to describe why they are here in more than financial terms. Have people got sufficient resources to do the job? You know, are the systems, processes, procedures, pay, all adequate, reasonable, and sensible? This is a struggle in a retail environment, a hugely competitive retail environment. To what extent do managers, team leaders, get to know people as individuals? To what extent are they really interested in them? as individuals? Do they understand their motives and, and personal goals? To what extent do they listen and learn from those people, are prepared to listen and learn from them? And to what extent do they offer them assignments, projects, opportunities to go outside of their comfort zone, to be stretched and pushed a bit, to do things that grow them as individuals, but also help the organization meet its goals. So that often is about coaching, it's about challenging, it's about asking, again back to that same simple thing about listening, asking people what they think can be done to improve the organization or the place that they work, or the services to their customers, or the way they deal with suppliers, or you know, the operational activities, all of which are absolutely critical of course in retail environments. Those are my suggestions. Okay, fantastic, John. Um, anyone to come back on any of John's points before we move on to the next question? No? Um, I, I'd just like to, um, I mean, I agree with everything that both Fraser and John have said. I think this, the thing about managers knowing people as individuals, um, that has come through so strongly from uh, not only the work of Engage to Success but other research projects. The just feeling valued by an individual, uh, which in a fast-moving environment, um, it's sometimes hard for even team leaders to remember the names of the people who work mm -hmm. in their teams. But you know, particularly working different shifts and so on, it's that personal connection that rep represents, if you like, the relationship that makes the word loyal, the relationship the person has with that organization. And a great manager um, or a great relationship with a good manager can actually keep people motoring and really productive and happy uh, for years, you know. Um, so I think that uh, that is a pretty crucial element to this um, from which one builds, as you say, builds out and creates a culture which is more dynamic and engaging. You know, Linda, that's such a good point, and it just reminds me, yesterday I was in a Tesco's buying some lunch, and I was observing, um, sadly, um, a team leader, and the struggle she was having, her focus was on task, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, her, her staff needed to do something, she was telling them what to do, she was telling them this, she was giving information, there was no time during the brief time that I observed her where she was taking the opportunity to, to listen to any of those members of staff or to observe what they were doing and whether they could be doing something different at that moment. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. One thing I picked up on, um, John, I think um, retailers, you know, they are often very structured organizations with a lot of rules. How do you think then they can balance that? Because you were saying before about, you know, engaged um, employees don't like to follow many kind of rules. Um, how, what are the best ways you, do you think they can strike that 
that real balance? Well, Matthew, first of all, I, I say it slightly flippantly because I don't actually mean that you have engaged employees running around in some <laughs> anarchic situation. Um, so it, rather it's about setting the, the, the agreement between the, organi between or the organization and the employees such that people know pretty clearly what is absolutely not negotiable, but then also how when they see things that aren't working well or could work better or they have great ideas, how what the, what the process, the methodology is for them to get those shared inside the organization and acted upon uh, and then listened to. So, you know, most organizations have some kind of of uh, employee suggestion scheme. Yeah. Um, you know, Tesco's now have a CEO who says to all employees, mail me, which is great. But probably, well, yeah. And if something happens as a result of it, then that is as good a way as any of getting things moving. The danger is that we that we as employees become inured, we become disappointed with the lack of response um, to, 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 to these proposals or ideas or schemes. So in summary, I do say engaged employees will, employees will want to bend and break the rules, but they're doing it for good reason. Yeah. Um, it's not about being, about creating anarchy. And Fantastic. every organization will approach things differently. So uh, there is a small retail chain near where I live called Cook, um, sells frozen food. The employees there seem to be able to, to break or bend some rules, um, to, you know, to have some flexibility in the way they engage with the customer, with the, the information they give, with their suggestions, with their views about the products. Um, that is inculcated into the culture of that organization. Um, but they're not, but, but there are still boundaries. I think Brilliant. just building on that, John, as well, I think that you know, your example that you give there of the person who's working on the front line, you've got integrity within the organization and this culture is living everywhere and hopefully they're following the example of the manager who's working with them. Because obviously, if the manager who's working with them is just task orientated, um, and when they sit down for their review meetings, it's just focused on um, basket size and um, and finance, etc., then that is the way that the supervisor will react to it. And it's yeah. about putting simple tasks in place that give you the opportunity to break that mold. Um, and these will be tasks. You know, it could just be the opportunity of going to someone and structuring a set 10 or 15 minute question and opportunity to say, come on, let's have a chat, let's talk about what's going on here. But you have to put them in a structure processes that give people that opportunity to break out of the mold. Otherwise, it's going to be difficult to do. And we talk about the engagement change being transformational. But ultimately, you have to put some kind of transactional activity in that you can measure and check and say, are we doing these things? which are the inputs to creating the output that ultimately makes the, the transformation happen. Um, and I heard a great example from someone who was um, the manager of a hardware store, and he was stood in the queue of his own store on the weekend, and the girl at the till um, didn't really give the kind of service that he was hoping for. And um, so when he got to the till, he said, look, can I, can I have a word? And he pulled her over. And he read her name badge and he said, look, Sarah, can I just say I didn't like the way that you handled that and we ought to do something maybe slightly different. Come and see me in my office on Monday. Right. And she said, well, first of all, my name's not Sarah, it's Jane, but this is the only name badge you had left to give me. Um, and, and secondly, I agree. What you've just put me through was horrendous, but your systems don't allow me to look after the customer in the right way. So I'll be delighted to come have a chat with you on Monday morning and we'll get it fixed. Mm. And you thought, fantastic. But they're the opportunities that we've got to create for people 
to come back and give that feedback. Otherwise, we're going to continue to disappoint the customers when actually the people at the front line know how to fix it. Yeah. Yeah. That's brilliant. Thank you for it. Oh, sorry, Linda. Of course you can. Move on, Matthew. Or um, you can. I'll just. It's fine. Carry. Carry on. Just a quickie. Um, completely different sector. A former colleague of mine called John Watmore did some research into um, what helped highly creative groups be successful. And obviously he concluded that you tended to get the better TV programs or the better writing output, etc., from people who loved their work and were engaged. And he did a study of one television producing organization that should be nameless which had become incredibly rule bound and bureaucratic and you know quite quite difficult for people to get on with their work because they were so having to tick boxes and John came up with this phrase based on some of the best managers he worked with uh, which was the manager as shield where the manager takes some of the flack for allowing people to use their discretion a bit more but within that encourages and enables people to give the best customer service or be as innovative as they're meant to be and deals with some of the bureaucratic stuff himself or herself to take the heat off people so they can do what they're meant to be doing to the best of their abilities. Excellent. And what was that? So was that from a um, publication, Linda, that piece of um, research? Yeah. It's um, called, I think it's called Leading Creative Groups, and it was by John Watmore. It's a good few years old now, but it should be available from Rocky Park. Um, Brilliant. At rockypark.com. That's great. Thank you, guys. Brilliant um, insight into the first question. So we move on to have a look at the second question now, and very much looking at how HR and line managers can work together um, to ensure a cohesive approach. So maybe John, do you want to kick off with this one? Oh yes, now, this is an interesting question because, uh, or to me it's an interesting question because sometimes people or organisations want to see employee engagement as an HR thing. Um, and frankly, it isn't. Mm. Um, it, it's not, it, as linking back to the previous discussion, engagement happens on the job between the line manager and their employees as individuals, minute by minute, day by day, week by week, month by month. So there's that old phrase, isn't there, that um, people join organizations that use managers. Um, and so we must, in my opinion, absolutely prevent HR, uh, in employee engagement being pigeonholed organizationally into an HR function um, or HR responsibility. So having said that, the flip of this is this is a fantastic opportunity for HR people and line managers to work to co-create employee engagement strategies, programs, activities, measurements um, that share the share the inputs from, from, from both or from all parts of the organization and because they're co-created become owned by both parts of the organization. So HR becomes the facilitator, the enabler, uh, the champion of the concept and perhaps also the people who demonstrate best practice and as such they become um, part of the solution whereby they are showing line managers this is how you do it and this is the value that you get from it. I guess those are my initial thoughts on this. Brilliant. Fraser. Yeah, I'd, I mean, I'd agree absolutely with John there in that um, employee engagement definitely should not sit as the total accountability of HR. HR would be facilitators in being able to deliver the process, as would people such as internal comms. 
um, who have an important role in being able to help this work as well. Um, so everyone has a role to do in being able to make engagement happen, as John says, you know, it's every hour, every minute, every day, um, is, the, is the relationship between the individuals. But it may be that because of the way that people have learned their management skills, that they need some more support in being able to identify how to make that happen. They maybe need some advice on you know, how do they do great onboarding, how do they improve their coaching skills. Um, how do that, you know, if they've got an issue with you know, maybe a lack of fairness in the organisation, particularly on the operational front, if people aren't getting engaged, you know, then seeking the HR assistance. Maybe HR have got access to metrics around people that they can share with them that will help the managers identify if they're helping to make it better. So is their employee turnover going down? Is their absenteeism rate going down? Are there engagement schools going up? So giving a really rounded view in supporting them. Maybe things like peer group interviewing is part of the ongoing strategy to improve engagement and get the team really bonded together in, in, uh, in how they work. Again, HR could support them in that. Um, so there's lots of roles where they can work together, um, but equally they have their own responsibilities in making this work. And would you say that in terms of your um, experience, who would you say is more likely to champion this kind of work? Is it more HR or is it the line manager or is it, does it really depend on the organisation? Um, from my perspective, it's dependent on the organisation. Um, and sometimes it comes all the way from the top, yeah. um, from, from the board level where they say, you know, this is how we are going to work. Um, but equally, you know, the, the, the HR will often be, for want of a better phrase, the nagging voice in the background saying, no, this was our commitment, this is what we're going to do, um, and this is going to how we're going we're gonna to make it happen. Sometimes, like the example that John gave of the Tesco employee, you know, the frontline operational gets a bit tough, so they do just occasionally need a little reminder about, you know, actually what is it that we set out to do, what is the culture that we're creating here. Um, but it will be different in each organisation from my perspective. Excellent. Thank you, Fraser. Linda, over to you. Yeah, I mean, again, I agree with both Fraser and John on um, you know, the fact that HR is absolutely not HR's um, responsibility or even it's not even desirable, really, that HR should be seen as um, leading on engagement in the isola in isolation from line management. I think it's very much as was said, you know, HR can provide all sorts of tools and approaches, can stimulate, act as a catalyst, make things happen, support people with their skills, um, line managers particularly. Uh, but it's line managers who make the difference to engagement on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, in my experience, where you get a truly great combination of a fantastic operations director, say, who wants to see, who, who knows his potential in this organization, wants things to be better, um, partnered with a great HR player, uh, then you can start to see, I mean, I have come across examples in the past and even now where that combination is a really fantastic um, changer of things and, and I think Fraser was also saying internal comms as you say this is area where an area where internal comms has a big big um, role and overlap with HR where there can be complementary uh, work done both around voice and some of the many ways in which people can be more engaged in um, by knowing more about what's happening and having their own voice heard and HR putting, um, if you like, the legs on initiatives that ma matter to employees as well, like career opportunities and so on. So I think, um, you know, particularly HR has a responsibility, I think, in making sure that uh, where engagement isn't improving, where engagement levels, if you are using surveys, are, are pretty static or declining, it's working with people to figure out what on earth is happening and what can be done about it and, um, and working with the line to address some of the issues that need to be improved. You mentioned metrics as well, uh, Fraser, about, um, uh, or was it John, um, about um, you know, using metrics as a way of alerting people to how things could be better. 
So think of one example of a retail bank operating um, throughout Asia and Africa. And if you use very simple metrics based on one of the um, well-known engagement surveys, um, they've uh, done a lot of number crunching to work out three or four things that mattered fundamentally, whichever part of the world they were operating in, to that company in how it treated its people. And, uh, and they were able to predict, almost like the famous uh, customer value chain, value profit chain, um, they were able to predict what difference how one line manager uh, was treating his or her employees versus another manager, what difference it would make month on month if they didn't change what they were, the approaches they were using. Um, so using metrics in a way that gave those managers feedback in time that they could do something about it, linking those metrics to, their, to managers' pay really got engagement of becoming a very, very major issue because to them it was crystal clear that there was a link to their business results. So um, for me, it's about HR's responsibility is really to work with managers to help them become the so-called engaging managers. And um, to, to recognize as well that employees themselves have got a big part to play in engagement. It's about, again, as we said earlier, about being open, listening, but also expecting employees to you know, be accountable for their own their own feelings, and um, you know, listening to suggestions from employees about how their well-being could be improved, or how the com company could get engaged in the community more, and seeing what can be done to build on some of those ideas and make it happen. You know, so so this is where HR really takes on more of an OD role, in my view, um, and works with line managers who. Uh, not only the people who get it, but you know the tougher job about winning over some converts to the idea that uh, one can become an engaging manager, and when one is, one gets better results from people, and by the way, feels better too. Brilliant. Thank you, Linda. And I think yeah. the metrics thing as well, I think, is so key for retail businesses. Their metrics obsess some of them. Some of my clients, they measure absolutely everything. So I think if we can get if they can have metrics, they can really see the value this is going to have on the bottom line or you know, the top line. I think this is going to be really interesting for them to really implement some real cohesive strategy there. If I can add a couple of points. Of course you can, yes. Um, metrics are vital. Um, and metrics are a way for HR to be able to have a voice at the top table alongside the financial metrics and the market share metrics, etc., etc. So I think you know, we're probably all agreeing that that is one of the key roles for HR. Um, the other thing that I wanted to come back to, I've just been thinking about it a bit more, is this idea that I have of HR as HR people as role models for the sorts of behaviors that we know drive employee engagement. Because in addition, or HR is intimately involved, certainly with line managers and supervisors and more senior people, um, at least in my experience of you know, being, a line, being, being an operational manager. Um, apart from my boss, the other department, the other people I was mostly engaged with was HR for all sorts of reasons because of the performance management process, appraisals, disciplinaries, recruitment, um, talent development, access to budgets for training, et cetera, et cetera. So it, in those, it's in those conversations between HR people and line managers that HR people can show what, show the behaviors, can, can role model the behaviors that, that we're looking for from line managers that will lead to the kinds of engagement levels and all the benefits that um, we've talked about and can also, in Linda's point, um, help identify those managers that get it and those managers that don't get it and work with them and their bosses to help them get it. So actually, HR has almost, as I think Linda said, that OD, um, culture change, enabling um, 
you know, the, the difference making opportunity here at a personal level for HR people. Fantastic. Which I, I personally find quite exciting. But uh, no, it's excellent, John. Thank you very much for that. Um, Excellent. Um, so if we can move on to the next question, um, and maybe some specific examples that you guys have where a strategy has really added value to the business as a whole. Um, I'm happy to, to kick off on this one, and uh, it, it's interesting that we were just having that conversation around the metrics, because the metrics are so key to being able to come up with with these um, these stories and the storytelling aspect again is key to the whole engagement so that people can see that, that they've got this. Um, so a couple of quick examples which um, I shared at the CIPD conference um, on engagement this year when I, I spoke on a, the metric piece. I did um, two very quick stories and examples. Um, there was one business that I worked with in Asia um, specifics of it but it was a huge issue um, and um, over six months after putting in some basic tools to help create this idea about purpose and voice and recognition um, we were able to reduce um, the turnover by 40 percent um, now that meant that in the six months they didn't have to recruit 400 employees and that meant that they saved 18,000 hours on time spent on training and recruitment. And that meant that they were able to instead invest those 18,000 hours in looking after the existing employees, looking after the customer. So the customer satisfaction scores went up and they started talking about people more positively. We actually also had people coming back to join the business who had left. So people were coming back who were already trained, which was fantastic. And as a consequence of these people wanting to be involved in what was happening in the business, we saw operating costs reduce by 17% because of the innovation that people were coming up with and saying, no, actually, we've got a better way of doing it, or we care about what's going on, or there were more right first time instances, so less having to go back and fix things. So one, one benefit out of everything else, all the other benefits that were going on, was operating costs went down by 17%. Um, in that organization in a six month period. Now, again, big impact, um, a big impact on the bottom line from being able to do that, let alone the recruitment costs and everything else. And then the other one was a business that I worked in where it was, we only did the engagement work in one of the three divisions um, that operated in this business, but they all did roughly the same thing. But at the end of two years, this division that we had worked with had higher engagement scores. Because it had higher engagement scores, it had lower retention rates. It had higher customer satisfaction scores by about 25%. It was quite staggering. And because of that, the customers were talking more positively about the organization, so better net promoter scores. So customers came back more often, and the business, the revenue, in that particular business grew by 12% over two years. 12% might not sound a lot, but when you consider that the other two divisions in that business went backwards, they had negative growth um, in those two years. It was a staggering change. The only thing that we changed was the basic principle rules around purpose, voice, praise, and the integrity in which we delivered it. And it saw just staggering differences in those businesses. Excellent. Thank you very much, Fraser. Um, moving on then to Linda, what are your thoughts on, on this? Have you got any examples? Um, yes, I think um, I'm, I'm just, just uh, perusing them. I should have uh, got a few, a few stats out, actually. Um, so I'll leave my comments at a relatively general level. Um, I think the um, what, what uh, depending on the sector, what seems to be coming through, if you take the old again, the uh, customer profit value chain, you know, where in theory employees who are feeling engaged perform better, they provide better service to customers, you get more return customers, uh, they, the customers spend more, and so investors are happy, etc. Um, that's, uh, that's 
a chain which works very well and quite clearly in retailing. It's a bit fuzzier in other sectors, um, and you know, sectors like the health service, for instance. Uh, the metrics tend to be somewhat different, you know, like in the NHS, of course, you've got mortality as um, an indicator of, uh, of successful treatment or not. And, you know, I know that Professor Michael West has uh, produced a number of studies over the years which suggest that uh, uh, areas and wards with um, high levels of engagement tend to have for comparable wards, lower levels of mortality of patients, which is obviously something of great interest to anybody going into hospital. Um, and uh, I come across one or two examples of wards that have become underperforming and where staff were ill more than their patients were, you know, were very high absence levels, where there was a determined effort to improve um, engagement, again, by taking some of these principles of voice, valuing people as individuals, sharing, creating a shared purpose, etc. Cutting a very long story short, um, one hospital did manage to significantly improve not only levels of engagement, but um, the health outcomes for the patients going through the ward, so much so that they wanted to clone what had happened which was basically a neuro-linguistic programming approach, helping people to really understand themselves a lot better, and um, wanted to clone this elsewhere. Um, so I think um, you know, this notion of what's a return on engagement for an engaged work, workplace, at, at global levels, you'll see increasingly strong correlations between, um, and our correlations, not always causality, uh, between what seems to be happening. For instance, there was a recent US study from a, um, by Russell Investment Group, and it found that over a 15-year period between the uh, 100 best companies in Fortune magazines, best companies to work for, uh, versus the Standard & Poor's 500, etc., that the Fortunes list um, have employers who offer much better workplaces and are measured in employee satisfaction scores. And naturally, those companies, in theory, perform twice as well as the general market, and 10.8% better than even the SAP um, Standard & Poor's best companies. So there is something going on about you know, the link between um, engagement, performance, and stock market returns, which makes for a fairly convincing case if you ramp it down to individual organizations. Um, you know, I can think of um, many examples of where the measures might be, for instance, um, there's a, a, a plastic bottles manufacturer, um, and uh, some of the, the, the metrics are to do with um, the, the spoilage rate, if you like, in, in terms of how the machinery operates and the number of reject bottles that come through. And what one managing director found that uh, was that uh, through focusing on engagement, really listening to people, really getting their ideas, energizing them, um, you know, making a personal investment, working at different shifts to make sure he got to know all the teams, that together they were able to improve engagement scores to such an extent that on all the usual metrics in that business, um, the uh, reject rates came down, profitability improved, and even though they actually lost one major contract, and with it, they had to lose a lot of staff. Nevertheless, there wasn't a strike. The staff who remained uh, worked, you know, doubly hard, and that company is now back profitable again, re-recruited re re uh, many of the staff that have had to lay off. So, you know, there are various metrics of success around this, and almost all of them are pretty convincing, I think, even without direct causality. Absolutely. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Linda. And uh, finally, John, over to you. Right. Yes. Well, I, first of all, I have to say I was just thought Fraser's stats were um, brilliant because it is great to be able to hear results at a at an organisational level, and then Linda's points at a more macro level are also absolutely on the right lines. Um, I don't have any individual specific examples to give you, um, but I would refer you to 
a publication, well, the publication that uh, started this all off, which is Engaging for Success, the McLeod Report, and to page 11 there, which has, in a very succinct manner, a set of correlates with performance, albeit based around 2006, um, which shows clearly the levels of difference between highly well, organizations with highly engaged workforces and organizations with low engaged workforces in a number of areas. Employee turnover is, is lower in the highly engaged organizations. Inventory shrink shrinkage is lower and accidents are lower. All of those are key metrics in the retail environment. Um, productivity is higher, profitability is higher. And more recently, a report that came out, I think only really in the last month, from um, what is called HR Guide to Transform Transformational Engagement. It's um, Linda mentioned best companies in the USA. This is the best companies data here in the UK. And they compared accredited best companies organizations um, share performance against the average or the overall FTSE 100. And it shows that the accredited companies, i.e. highly engaged companies, out shares outperformed the FTSE by 3.5 times. That's a, and that, that's grown since 2006. So that's a pretty strong metric for um, senior managers dealing with shareholders on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. Those are my thoughts on this question. Fantastic. Thank you, John. Um, I think we can now move on to the final um, question, um, which is yeah, more around how to perhaps adapt a strategy to fit an entire organization with quite a diverse set of people working different levels of organization in you know, different different job roles um wonder what your thoughts were on creating that strategy where everyone can be engaged shall i yeah please do um, yeah, I mean, I, I think as the question implies, there's no one size fits all, and um, and even if there were, it would change anyway as people grow older, etc. So I think there is something here about um, having to, if you want to really understand what is going to motivate, appeal to, or demotivate certain groups or certain individuals, you have to take a somewhat segmented approach to the whole idea and really, um, without um, overly categorizing people, get to grips with what are the key messages about what appeals to certain people more than others. And obviously, there will be some things that um, are common to people of all generations and all nationalities. Um, you know, things like varying degrees of uh, interesting work, having, having um, uh, feeling valued by people, having the relevant level of support um, according to the needs that people have for support, maybe even wanting different degrees of connection with the organization at an emotional level. But there'll be other things that maybe, you know, are very specifically not for everybody. I think it's worth trying to get to grips with what those determinants are, probably in the first place, for the people you see as key to the future of the organization. And, you know, stereotypes around the different generations, I think, are stereotypes. Um, but that doesn't mean they're worthless. I think there's plenty to be said about, uh, we talk so much about the me generation of Generation Y and, you know, wanting freedom, wanting this, that, and the other. As I said, I think there are probably more things that they share in common with the baby boomers who are now leaving organizations in droves um, than, than we perhaps uh, have realized. And I argue that, in fact, it's probably um, the one area where you could get a common agreement is that some degree of flexibility in working opportunity, given that there are so many means now for people to work in different ways, um, you know, on different forms of contract, 
that are employee choice, not just employer choice, and is one way in which you could try and make sure that everybody has the opportunity to be engaged. Also, you know, giving people choice of benefits, giving them chance to, um, if they're really into well-being, at least have access to privileges that keep them, you know, healthy and, and, and well if they want to tap into them, and raising awareness of other people that previously have been couch potatoes or whatever. Um, certainly some of the universities are going in for um, active health and well-being programs that people who would never once have even dreamt of taking part in a gym type activity are now engaged in because they're more imaginative. They're, they're really, you know, touching people where they want to be uh, um, fitter, if you like. Um, and finally, I think coming up with new ways of envisaging careers, the fact that people are going to have multiple careers probably in a working lifetime. So finding ways to help people move um, sideways, upwards, grow skills if they leave, not seeing it as a tragedy, but making sure you've got a good bench strength of people with similar skills so that you're not left high and dry if someone does move on, but then have an open door if they want to come back. I think all these are aspects of similarity and difference, which this is an area where I think HR in particular could do some really active championing, um, because diverse workforces are here to stay. So uh, we might as well come to grips with it. Brilliant. Thank you, Linda. Uh, John, what are your thoughts? So my thoughts are... Um, that this is a complex thing. <clears throat> um, the, all the organization can do, must do, is create the environment in which engagement can take place. So that means the culture, leadership, vision, values, purpose, the processes, the procedures, the structures, the measurements, the metrics, and then that, and then give the opportunity to every individual to figure out what their values and beliefs are, the things that are important to them, to understand what their strengths and skills and competencies are, and then for, for the individual to become engaged requires them to take ownership of matching what they're looking for, their, um, their, their their goals, their personal goals, with what their employer's goals are. So when we talk about no one size fits all, absolutely, that the answer is to turn this on its head and not and, and for the for the for the employer to give employees the opportunity to create their own future within that organisation, subject to the boundaries and the values and the, and, and the purpose. Um, and you know, rules and procedures. Um, and you know, the way we go about doing that is we say that every employee should have the opportunity to create a personal development plan that's their plan and that takes advantage of all the or what the choice of the services and the and the um, and the benefits and the resources that their employer offers, but is crafted and owned by the employee. Now, that is easy to do in, in parts of organizations where uh, you know, people are highly paid and, and, and kind of self-motivated. Um, so, you know, in retailers, it doesn't it's difficult to do that perhaps at the shop floor level, at the front line level. Um, but in the managerial and leadership roles and in the functional roles, uh, and in roles which require people to be emotionally or attached to their business, like the innovation roles, product development, uh, strategy development, etc. So we also have we also have to think of retailers are not in themselves, um, oh, sorry, retailers in themselves have multiple different groups of people and individuals with, with, with different skill levels, not, it's not just Brilliant. Thank you, John. And if, Fraser, if you can round us off with this uh, question. Yeah, no problem. Um, I mean, 
again, you know, lots of very good, valid comments um, going ahead there. Um, I would also just sort of add the question to this, that actually why does um, the engagement work and, and, and why does it benefit businesses and that? There's obviously a, a neurological impact on that and there's lots of books being written around uh, the neuroscience and the impact on engagement and creating towards behaviours and, and all of these sorts of things. So when we're talking about what do we need to do to engage a diverse workforce, there are some elements that will be similar that we need to be focusing on. We need to be focusing on creating um, happy employees and there are certain activities that we need to do there. We need to be giving people the opportunity for social connection. We need to give them the opportunity to feel that they have the opportunity for self-improvement and that the work that they do is worthwhile and they make a difference. And so whatever it is that we're looking at doing within an organization, we need to make sure that it focuses on, on that because then we will get the vast majority of the people who are, who are working there. And by doing that, you know, we can be looking at making sure that we've focused on purpose and novelty in the way that we work and opportunities and social connection and unexpected rewards and believing that things are going to get better um, within the business and all of those sorts of things will have that positive approach. Now, on John's comment there, it may be that the key is that we need to work with businesses to give them a basic practical structure, which is you know, one of the tools we use is you know, various practical structures, so that when you then engage with that employee and you have the conversations and you have the communication opportunities, they do have that opportunity to commit as much as they want to, but those who want to commit then have the opportunity to, to go on, be involved, have the autonomy and the empowerment. Excellent, thank you Fraser. And um, that was actually our last question, um, but I'm quite happy if any of you do want to summarize or you know add anything else to the webinar before we finish well I would just like to say it's been fascinating listening to my two colleagues on this matter and to realize um, I suppose levels of agreement and also perhaps some subtle distinctions about some of the things that we think are important that's, that's pretty much a measure of, of, of us as individuals, of human beings. So thank you. Not a problem. It's been great to have you all three here. I think it's been great listening to you, and I'm sure that the um, attendees have found great um, value in all of what you guys have said. Um, I said I definitely have, and uh, yeah, it's a very interesting topic that I think continues to be something that uh, my clients talk to me about when I'm taking job briefs and we're talking about the people. So thank you very much for the insight. Fraser and Linda, any um, you know uh, passing comments from well, you guys before we finish? Echo what John said. I've, I've enjoyed very much the uh, the conversation, and um, you know I think I think as as, um, as has been highlighted, you know there are a number of common strands to what we're what we're suggesting, and we bring we bring different practical and other experiences to bear on the issue. But what struck me is just um, how rich and live um, this subject is. That it's um, it's a really meaningful subject, and that uh, you know if we're at the beginning of a mountain, then it's not that high a mountain. I think we, we just need to carry on collectively climb it and climbing it and finding ways to uh, you know help work become more worthwhile generally for people and so that they can have happy and healthy lives. Excellent. Hi, Thank I, you, Linda. Equally Matt, I'll just say thanks very much for the opportunity. A really interesting um, discussion and session. Um, and you know as I hear so many people talking about now, you know, now is the time to be working in HR because the opportunities on how to influence a business in its strategic direction through considering the, how you can support engagement and your line operatives, you know, there has never been a better time for it. And I think that there have been some people who have taken the opportunity to get on board with engagement 
and still saw the benefits of that early on. I think it was um, an advantage and now it's a must-have and I think that where the organizations have got now is that engagement took you forward whereas I think now we're at the position where without engagement you will start to see your business go backwards I think that's where we're getting to. Excellent well thank you very much guys uh, thank you for, for joining us and for uh, sharing your thoughts your opinions and your in your insights it's been fascinating um, as mentioned we will be um, this session has been recorded so I will be forwarding um, the recording off to all of those who have attended um, thank you very much and have a great evening thank you thank you bye bye thank you bye